Hello, everyone. I would like to um, welcome everyone here uh, to uh, our International Day of Forest Tree Talks events. Uh, we're very excited uh, to have you all here. My name is Britt Biedenbender and I'm the Financing Change Director for Canopy. I'm coming to you from Cape Cod, Massachusetts, which was once Wampanoag Territory. I would like to um, welcome everyone to Canopy's second tree talk, but before we get started, I want to quickly run through some housekeeping tidbits that you can also see on the screen here. Uh, basically, if you have any tech issues, uh, please visit uh, the Q&A and uh, put it in the question and answer, and uh, our tech support will give you a hand. If you have any video issues and you need to call in, there's a local number to connect to the event audio with your phone, and, and it's been posted in the chat. And then most importantly, I want to point out that we have two ways of communication here tonight. One is in the chat. This is where uh, guests can chat back and forth with one another. And then the Q&A is for the Q&A session uh, with author Michael Christie. And so um, just be aware that if you post a question in the chat, we will not see it. So it has to go in the Q&A. Also, if you would like to make sure that you're uh, seeing the speaker, make sure that you switch your view to speaker view. And um, some of you know Canopy, but others are new to us. So I wanna share a bit about who we are and what we do. Every year, 3.2 billion trees are cut down from ancient and endangered forests and transferred, uh, transformed sorry, into t-shirts and boxes. The science has told us that these forests are home to 80% of the world's terrestrial biodiversity and that these carbon sinks represent 30% of the climate solution. Founded in 1999 by Canopy Executive Director Nicole Rycroft, Canopy is a global solutions-driven environmental NGO dedicated to protecting the world's forests, species and climate and advancing community rights. Canopy's unique model of change harnesses the purchasing influence of the global marketplace by building transformational partnerships with hundreds of the world's largest brands, including Zara and Inditex, Amazon, LVMH, Scholastic, The Guardian, Walmart, and H&M. To date, over 750 brands worth over 800 billion in sales are partnered with Canopy as they work to transform the fashion, paper, and packaging industries. We work with these brand partners to leverage their purchasing clout to eliminate ancient and endangered forests from unsustainable supply chains, catalyze next generation solutions, and secure landscape forest conservation and community rights here in Canada and globally. Tonight's Tree Talks discussion will be, will be led by Canopy's, Canopy's Laura Repass. She will be covering for Canopy's Executive Director, Nicole Rycroft, who was supposed to be here tonight, but unfortunately came, came down uh, with some horrible bug this weekend. So Laura Repass is uh, Canopy's communications marketing specialist and has been with Canopy for over six years. Before working at Canopy, she worked in the book and publishing industry for nearly 18 years. We are thrilled that Michael Christie, acclaimed author of the novel Greenwood, will be joining us for tonight's Tree Talks event. Tree Talks were created to bring thinkers, scientists, and artists and conservationists into a conversation with Canopy and our community about forests, climate conservation, and solutions. We invite Michael Christie, we invited Michael Christie to talk about his novel Greenwood because it is a work that is not only about trees and forests, among other things, it also reflects trees in its structure and meditates on its roots in its storytelling. Greenwood is something of a genre-defying novel, but in part, it is a meditation on an illustration of the innate links between people and forests. It's a thought-provoking, imaginative, imaginative, and richly told page turner. With that, let's welcome Laura and Michael to the screen. Laura, will you start us off? Uh, yes, uh, I'm happy to start us off. Thank you very much, Britt. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, Nicole sends her regrets. Uh, she really wanted to be here tonight, and... Um, but I'm very happy to be hosting and I'm um, coming to you from Toronto, which is the traditional territory of many First Nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee and the Wendat peoples and is now home to many diverse First Nations to Inuit people and Métis. Um, I'm very glad to be here tonight. Happy International Day of Forests. Um, welcome, Michael. It's really nice to see you. Thanks for having me, Laura. It's great to be here. <laughs> 
So I'm just going to give everybody a short um, intro to Michael, a little bit of his work, a teeny bit about Greenwood before we jump into the to the interview. So uh, Michael Christie is the author of the novel If I Fall, If I Die and the linked collection of stories, The Beggar's Garden, which won the Vancouver Book Award. Greenwood, which we'll be talking about tonight, is his most recent novel. It's an international bestseller published in 10 languages, maybe more now, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, and I think so. But, yeah, <laughs> was long listed for the Scotia Bank Giller Prize and won the Arthur Ellis Award for Best Novel. Um, Greenwood has been heaped with praise by reviewers and has been called everything from a literary page turner to beguilingly structured and elegantly written. Um, we love it because it illustrates in literary form the answer to the question, why are forests so important? Michael is a former carpenter and homeless shelter worker. He grew up in Thunder Bay, a town where forestry is a key industry. And now he divides his time between Victoria and Galliano Island, where he lives with his wife, the novelist Cedar Bowers, and their two sons in a timber frame house that he built himself. There you go. <laughs> is, it, is that where you are now? It is, yes, yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Um, so um, we're not, um, before we get into talking about the book, I we wanted to start off by finding out if you have an early memory or a first memory of being in a forest. I do, yeah. As you mentioned, Laura, I grew up in Thunder Bay, Ontario, in a sort of suburban area. But behind our house was a creek and a wooded, uh, uh, a, a section of wooded land. And I remember some of my earliest, earliest memories were playing in the creek, uh, kind of floating uh, in it in the summertime and looking up at the trees and the mm -hmm. leaves, kind of the light dappling through the leaves. So yeah, I mean, uh, Thunder Bay is a very isolated place. It's eight hours to the nearest uh, large city, which is Winnipeg. Um, and so it's, you know, surrounded by trees. And, uh, you know, it was a big part of my uh, upbringing, for sure. That sounds lovely. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm sure many of the people joining us tonight are familiar with the book, but for those of us who aren't, we're wondering if you could give us a quick overview of the story. Absolutely. It's uh, an intergenerational family saga um, that spans 140 years, and it tells the story of the people who are known as the Greenwood family. Um, mm -hmm. It's four generations uh, and centers on various characters uh members of the family and the kind of the unifying uh trait family trait is that every generation has something to do with forests and trees so there's a timber tycoon there's a person who uh makes a sort of subsistence living off of maple syrup tapping there's a a leading scientist who studies the communicative nature of trees and there's a carpenter and there's an eco uh activist um, so they're a family who's very much uh, entwined with uh, forests and trees, and uh, Greenwood is their story. Ah, thank you. That's a great. That's a great overview. So the opening section of Greenwood is set in 2038, and it begins in in a dark place because of climate change. In in this future, there's been a blight on trees, and there are almost no trees left on the planet. And much of the planet is uninhabitable. Um, but uh, this certain remaining island of intact ancient forests has become this exclusive resort only for the rich. Why did you choose to start there? I'm not sure if I chose it as <laughs> much as it ended up there. Uh, I mean, I, as you mentioned, I spend a lot of time on Galliano Island. When I was writing the book, I was living here on the island full time. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, this book has been described as dystopian, it's been mm. described as climate fiction, there's this new yeah. term called cli-fi, which I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with. Oh, I learned that. <laughs> I learned, yeah, I learned it after I uh, did it. So, um, but, you know, I really wanted this book to be um, much more immediate, um, 1934 is not that far into the future, obviously, and it seems short, it's shorter and shorter every day. And so I wanted this, this calamity that I've imagined called the Great Withering to be very sort of threatening to the reader and very real feeling, um, you know, just in the sense of, 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 of showing where 
our current policies, climate related policies are, are heading. And I will say one more thing that the Great Withering required much less imagination than I wish it would have, um, because even here on Galliano Island, the uh, Western red cedar, which is a tree that's been used since time immemorial by indigenous people here for various wonderful purposes. Uh, many of those are browning and dying now uh, due to repeated drought stress. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, the great withering, it could be argued, has already begun to some degree. Oh, <laughs> um, so I, the, the opening section and closing section, they are because they are so plausible, they're very scary um, and very, very well rendered, but not the whole, not the whole book. Uh, the whole book is structured uh, like the rings of a tree. So it begins in 2038, and then it goes back in time to cover events in the lives of the different generations of the Greenwood family, uh, back to what would be like the inception of this particular family. And, um, and then it works its way back in time um, from, 1904 back to 2038. Um, so what came first? The idea of the structure or had you thought of the family? And I know I changed this question. <laughs> I, I sort of changed how to ask this question because it dawned on me that that's, that's what I, what I really wanna know is, did, you, did the structure come first or had you thought of this intergenerational family first? Um, it began as it always begins for, with me and, and that is you know very messily very chaotically. Uh, I had some ideas for some characters. I had some people I, I was you know, interested in, um, but it wasn't until I came upon this structure that I really sort of realized that these people I was imagining were part of the same family and so part of the same history. Um, and the, you know, I've, I, I must say that I, it, it happened in a kind of an epiphanic moment, I was cutting down a small tree uh, on our property to make way for a driveway. Um, and I was with my sons and it was a big kind of event. And, uh, uh, you know, we, we thanked the tree for its, for giving its life. And we were using the wood for various purposes. And, you know, um, I cut it down and, and we were looking at the stump of the tree. And I kind of had this moment where I realized that this tree's narrative the narrative of its life was contained within the tree's structure right and that these rings obviously are yearly growth rings but they are also the sort of the story of its own life and that it was older than me it was older than my father who'd recently passed away it was around the age of my grandfather who's who passed away so it, it really hit home for me this sense of um the, the narrative that is contained in a tree. And I thought, what an interesting way to structure a book. Um, and after that, you know, four years later, uh, Greenwood, <laughs> Greenwood was born. Oh, that's such a great inspiration. Um, so uh, each of the characters in the book um, have a different relationship with trees. They all have a fairly intense relationship with trees and forests, but it's all different. So for some characters, forests are like a money-making resource only, or a treasure to be protected, or a material from which something beautiful can be made. For, for one character, it's tied to his living, but it's also, it seems like the place he's most happy and comfortable. So um, which of these relationships and characters do you identify with most? Before I answer that, I really want to say that I love uh, the way a novel can take a particular thing or idea or issue and look at it from a myriad of, 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 of perspectives and almost like a prismatic view of, of forests. And, I, and I, that was very important for me to do with this book. Um, but if I was going to select uh, a particular, I mean, you know, for, for me, I mean, I, I'm a carpenter, I, you know, we built this house out of wood that was here on the property um, that, that we had, that we brought down and had milled right here. And so, you know, I have a very kind of deep personal connection, not only to carpentry, but also to, you know, walks in the forest and, you know, being, finding a real sense of solace and uh, peace uh, in a, in a forested place uh, and on an island like this. So, 
I mean, probably Liam Greenwood, for those who are familiar with the book, is close. Uh, Everett, obviously. And then also, I mean, I, I certainly do have uh, convictions uh, similar to Willow Greenwood in terms of the preservation of old growth and the preservations of forests. Um, I haven't made much money off forests, so I'm not <laughs> sure how me and Harris Greenwood can line up, but uh, yeah. <laughs> But all the characters are very complex, right? So even Harris yeah. has these glimmers of like a love for the for trees and for forests. Yeah, and I think I really wanted to dimensionalize the characters and not have, say, the environmentalist to just be this noble uh, rescuing yeah. figure. You know, there's there are costs for her ideology, and you know, just like there's costs for all ideologies, and yeah. so I, and and as well as the timber tycoon, I wanted him to be motivated. Um, for 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 human reasons, uh, sort of beyond just simple greed, um, and I do that with all of my fiction. I love characters that are more complex than you know a simple uh, explanation. Yeah, what well, they're fun to read and they're recognizable as as humans. Um, so I imagine that through researching and writing Greenwood and doing loads of interviews about Greenwood, you must have learned a lot about the importance of forests. So what are your feelings about the state of the world's forests now? Oh, boy, uh, it's such a difficult, I've, I've often compared it, it's like trying to explain the importance of clean water or air. Yeah. I mean, it's like beyond important, um, you know, but obviously the carbon capture, the soil retention, the, you know, the water filtration, the just sheer effect uh, that forests have on our well-being, mm -hmm. uh, I think, you know, all of these are reasons that, you know, we need to protect and conserve and promote and uh, 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 forests globally. So, um, you know, I, it's interesting. I, I often get asked to speak uh, on the topic of trees and forests. And mm -hmm. it's, it's, I'm certainly uh, more of a layman in terms of the scientific uh, stuff, but I really, I think with this book, I wanted to delve into the emotional aspect of trees and forests. And I wanted to emotionalize them and make them uh, really feelable by the reader. And, you know, with the hopes that there would be a new appreciation for, uh, trees and forests in, in, in a reader's life after they shut the, shut the cover. Yeah, yeah. I think you, I think the book, I think the book does that. And I also think Thanks. I told you that I, that I read the book and then I finished it. And then I went back and I read the first half again <laughs> because it, because of the, because of that unique structure, it was, uh, it, it was really fun to go back and see um, some of the, some of the things that were alluded to that would happen later. So knowing all you know now, is there a message um, in Greenwood, do you think, for decision makers about forests? Yeah, I mean, I didn't set out to write a sort of uh, propagandistic, uh, <laughs> polemical novel, um, but I think that all novels um, and all stories are political on some level. And, and um, you know, this, book, I think really, I hope at least it, it illustrates our deep fundamental connection, um, not only emotionally, but, you know, physically in terms of our, even our human evolution, I think is quite entwined with trees. So, you know, um, they are, forests and trees are something that we not ought to protect, but must absolutely protect if this climate is going to look anything like the climate that we are used to. And so, I mean, hopefully policymakers would read it and come to a new um, conviction to preserve and protect and promote uh, trees and forests. Yeah, we hope so too. Well, there's also something about a literary approach that that emotionalizing forests, you know, and and placing human stories in them, it uh, it does something to increase the reader's empathy for both the characters and and the things they value. And so, you know, it's not a polemic, but it I think it activates something in the reader reading Greenwood. I hope so. I mean, this it's how I read. I'm I I read nonfiction and I enjoy it. But if you give me a story and if you give me someone to care about as I'm learning. 
uh, I find that I retain way more information um, than if I'm just reading facts and, 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 and data. So I think it's, it's my job as a novelist to, um, to you know, uh, emotionalize the topic and to dramatize the topic in a way that people can absorb. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so while you were writing the CLIFI or um, 2038 future portions, yeah. of Green One, did it, it, it gave me a lot of anxiety reading it. It is a sort of a vision of climate anxiety. Did it, did you feel that while you were creating it? I did. I mean, you know, I, I have two young children and not yeah. only my children, I know other children who I care about and I, you know, I care very, uh, uh, uh I, 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 I really care obviously about the future of our planet and not only that, but just retaining a climate that it, it all resembles the one that we know and love. Um, and so, you know, it was play, written from a place of climate anxiety. I, you know, uh, it's something that I experience regularly. Um, and, I, and especially I think living in a sort of semi rural island community um, you're much closer to the effects of these changes, um, you know, and speaking to indigenous people on Galliano Island who's, you know, remember the way the bull kelp piled up on the beaches in a way that it does not do anymore, you know, those kinds of realizations um, are very powerful and very immediate to you as a, as a resident of a place like this. So I, you know, it's, uh, but I, I hope at least that that anxiety would be a kind of a wake up call for people yeah. reading the book. And I, you know, I do think that the book generates a certain amount of hope um, with respect to the, the way the characters in the book care for one another, the way that they act collectively, um, the way that they sort of forge ahead, even during things like the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl, which was a climate disaster and an economic disaster. Um, you know, that was a big part of the research was researching the Dust Bowl, particularly in Canada. And I was astounded by the resilience uh, and the grit of people to take care of one another during times that were unimaginably difficult. Um, so that gave me hope, that idea that we can we can do that again, and we've done it before, and um, that's what's going to take to prevent a uh, future like the one I've imagined. Yeah, I think we agree at Canopy. It's a lot of a lot of cooperation and collaboration, and and will. Absolutely. Um, so, how would you encourage your readers to engage with forests? I don't know. I mean. Hopefully you already do in, in the way that you do. I mean, there are so many things to do in the forest. Obviously, forest bathing, walking, hiking, biking, even just looking at trees, I think has enormous psychological benefits that are just being studied and just being understood now. Um, so, I, yeah, I mean, I'm not sure. I, mean, I think, you know, a huge theme of the book also, though, is the fact that this Greenwood Island and the Arboreal Cathedral are uh, a access by rich people only. And there's certainly a class uh, critique embedded, I think, in Greenwood. And the idea that formerly natural spaces were uh, accessible by everyone and by the poor, even pro predominantly, who worked in those spaces. And now, as those spaces shrink, they're becoming walled off to um, folks who live in cities or folks who are, you know, living in urban environments more and more. So, I mean, I think it's very, very important that we uh, preserve, not only preserve those natural spaces, but preserve our access to those natural spaces and our easy access to those natural spaces. So I would encourage everyone to access those spaces they, 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 they do have and um, to enjoy them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how would we? And learn about them and uh, yes. yeah, what it takes to preserve them. So um, 
At Canopy, we like to ask this question or a similar question in all kinds of settings. We like to ask this question, you know, when we're together with each other uh, doing things, we like to ask these questions at like important business meetings and presentations um, to sort of loosen people up. So, uh, so we're going to sort of close with this one. You and I will at least in our part of the talk. Uh, do you good. have a favorite forest creature? Whew. <laughs> I do. I, I do. I do. Um, my youngest son and I, um, he's, he's a very kind of dreamy kid who loves to read and loves to be in the natural world. And we have this kind of uh, ritual where we lay uh, in sleeping bags on our deck uh, in kind of in the middle of the forest and look up at the sky and, and around twilight and, and count bats and <laughs> We have a kind of a competition, you know, to see who can count the most bats before it gets dark and he has to go to bed. So I, I'm not sure. I know there are many, many species of bats that live in uh, these trees. So I'm not sure particularly which bat I'm looking at, but uh, those bats are probably my favorite. I, I love bats. So do I. I love watching them. And the way they move is sort of hypnotic. It is. It doesn't it make sense. I know they're they're almost frantically swimming in the air, and I just am so proud of them for uh, flying. It's incredible. <laughs> they're amazing. I love them. Yeah, me too. You go bats, and I also yeah. like to think of them up there eating lots of mosquitoes. <laughs> yeah, I know, and they're yeah, they're serving that wonderful purpose as well. Yeah. yeah. So um, thank you, Michael, and we're gonna see if anybody who's joined us tonight has some questions. Oh, here we go. Oh, I have a few. I have a few already. Thank you for sending these questions into the Q and A. Um, so the first one is: um, I've just reserved your book at my local library. I hope you don't mind. <laughs> we, we're big fans of libraries. Most most writers are, I think. Um, I might as well buy it after I've read it because I like to share books and would love to share it with my book club. Your topic engages so many people. Um, and I love your emotional attachment to the novel and to the topic. Oh, that's a comment, not a question. Okay, Thank you very much, Cindy. <laughs> um, so this is, this I think is a question. I'm curious about how Michael mapped out Willow's journey and um, how she faced her future once she understood her family legacy. Yeah, I mean, it's, I don't want to give away too many spoilers, but uh, Willow Greenwood is a person who grows up, uh, uh, who whose father is a is a very wealthy timber tycoon and she kind of rejects his ideology and she uh, lives in a in a Volkswagen van and travels around sabotaging logging equipment uh, in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and for her character, I did a great deal of research. I um, obviously read a lot of uh, memoirs and, and books about the early environmental movement um, here on the West Coast. I interviewed a few people um, to just try to get a feel for, for that time. Um, and, you know, her decision, I don't want to give too much away here, but she makes a large decision regarding her inheritance. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I've heard from readers who said that they, they struggled with that because, um, you know, maybe she could have done more good with the money, uh, oh, yeah. and that kind of thing. Right. And so, but I, you know, I really felt like, um, that that decision um, said a lot about her character. And I think that particularly the sort of 70s activism really was uh, um, very um, sort of driven by I taking ideological stands and working kind of outside of the system and rejecting the system. Here on Galliano, there are many, many back to the landers and, you know, uh, old hippie folks who uh, have, have come here to live. And, you know, that is very much the sense that I get from there is sort of a dropout mentality rather than change from within mentality. So, uh, I thought it made sense for, for her, although it maybe was, uh, dramatic. <laughs> I thought it made sense for her too. She seemed like a, like a stubborn driven, you know, she had, she had many reasons to reject it, not just her. Yes. Of course. Um, so this is a second question. This is from Kirat Dudley. Harvey Lomax's character, um, which we who we haven't really even touched on, but is it was a great character and really tragic, um, really stuck with me. I found it incredible how you were able to have a reader empathize with him due to his pain. 
and having him support a large family, but not wanting him to succeed, right? Because there's another character that we're rooting for at the same time. So what kind of research do you do to create a character like Lomax with his addiction to opium in the 30s? Yeah, I mean, there. it's interesting. I've really been astounded by the, there are three characters in this book who people fall all over the place in terms of whether they like them or not. Right. Uh, and that's Harris Greenwood, Harvey Lomax, and Willow Greenwood. There are people yeah. who de detest those people, and there's people who you know love um, and totally empathize with them. And I'm you know that that makes me happy uh, mm -hmm. as a novelist because that you know shows a certain amount of dimension, hopefully. Um, but I mean, Harvey Lomax uh, is a is a man um, who has a family. Um, and has a difficult upbringing and through the course of the 1934 section ends up losing his, his everything uh, uh, to, to his addiction. And if you think about Everett Greenwood, he's a person who begins with nothing. Um, he begins sort of a broken person and ends up finding a uh, family um, uh, by the end. So they almost had this kind of inverse parallel journey um and i you know it was really important to me to have lomax not just be an antagonist uh not just a kind of a bad guy um and i certainly i mean i i worked uh, as was mentioned in the intro uh in the downtown east side for 10 years at a homeless shelter that was particularly for folks struggling with mental health and addiction issues at the same time um uh and there's also a whole bunch of addiction related uh, uh, stuff going on in my family as well. So I feel like I drew upon some personal experience, lots of professional experience and just kind of personal uh, uh, experience, you know, helping folks out who are struggling with uh, addictions. Um, and, you know, there's, there's a point where in the, in the story where Lomax ends up kind of in that neighborhood that I was uh, working in for so long. So I, you know, I, uh, I feel like I, I did, I ended up working with many people who are kind of at the end of a journey like Lomax. Yeah. Yeah. I also felt like he was very tied to, you know, he, he, he went from being a person who developed this addiction in the thirties and then decades later, he's, he's on the streets in the downtown East side, I guess, much like people that you, that you knew connecting him very much to uh, Vancouver as we understand it now. Yeah. And I, I mean, also, I think, you know, there's, there's an indelible link between resource extraction and uh, addiction and yeah. this kind of um, trauma that people undergo and people who are working away from home and they're not able to form families and they have a bunch of money and they end up on Skid Row. I mean, that's how the Antony side of Vancouver began was loggers uh, handing wow. over uh, uh, their salary to be drunk for a couple months and then going back out into the bush to do more work. So there's, I wanted to kind of establish that um, connection as well with him. Yeah. Yeah. He was, I thought he was a very sympathetic character because he was so physically and emotionally and uh, tortured. Yeah. Um, so here's another question from James Parker. People in urban areas do not have forest consciousness. Individual tree protection may be, but little appreciation for the overall canopy of an urban forest. How might this change? Oof. I, that's um, a tough one. I mean, that is a tough one. I mean, I, you're, you're absolutely right. And I think, you know, I, I'm just a huge believer in getting people access. I, I yeah. lived for some years in the down, in the downtown side, I also lived in the West end of Vancouver, which is right near Stanley park. Yeah. And the value of a place like Stanley park is incalculable uh, mm -hmm. to the people of Vancouver. And so, I mean, Obviously, we need to establish more urban green spaces because people are going to live in more dense urban environments and it needs to be a top priority to set those spaces aside. And I'm not sure why we're not building any more Central Parks or Stanley Parks, but yeah, we need, yeah, we need to. Yeah, we need that to. Would be, that would be amazing. Yeah. yeah. The, um, I also think that people can uh, like encourage one another to learn 
and to find out what local forested areas are um, and that there are organizations within cities, I think that that help with this. And there's a lot of education around it, I think with kids in schools. But so, so I think it's, I would say to James, like, drag your friends to the forest that you like, tell your family um, and research what's going on. Uh, I think that's something all of us can do. Uh, so here's one. Um, I haven't read your book yet, but I have a question for you personally. Do you believe that trees have emotions and feelings and a spirit? That's from Kim Fulton. <laughs> this is what I that mean, Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Peter Will Elvin got in trouble or was celebrated also for his uh, verbs in The Hidden Life of Trees. I'm not sure if yeah. you read it, but he uses very kind of um, humanistic uh and uh descriptors for trees and i and i i mean it obviously comes down to how you define an emotion um yeah. how you define a thought which you know these things are not settled and uh wonderfully not settled and they're mysterious and i love this entire area of of science yeah. um so i do i do think they do have emotions and i think that they on some level think um in terms of so they certainly react they certainly plan they certainly yeah. uh communicate mm -hmm. they certainly share um so uh you know i think that this debate has more to do with our um definition of thinking than it does uh to do with the fact that trees are sentient beings and are worth our respect and our care. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's a that's a great answer, Michael. And Kim, I don't know if you were at our first tree talk with um, Suzanne Samard, but there's a, a lot of her work involves these kinds of ideas. And so you could find that tree talk on our website, or you know, she's she's all over the internet, so you can you can find out about that research if you don't know already. I suspect maybe you do. Um, so. Uh, I have loved books that make me think after I finished the book, both Greenwood and If I Fall, If I Die left me pondering trees, conservation, mental health and addiction. Do you intentionally write your fiction to elicit readers to change their thinking? Uh, we traveled to Thunder Bay this summer and thought, your, thought of your books as we drove by the grain elevators, especially. And are you working on something new now? So that's, that's a, wow. a, few barrels, a few barrels in that one for you. This is from Susan Gibson. Thank you, Susan. So the first one is, do you intentionally write fiction to elicit readers to change their thinking? Thank you, Susan Gibson. Uh, <laughs> you're, you're amazing. And I appreciate your support. Um, um, yeah, I, I think all good storytelling and all uh, well-told narratives ought to elicit uh, changes in our thinking. Um, you know, it's certainly difficult for a novelist to predict what kind of changes are going to take place. Um, but, um, you know, I, I, I think there is nothing like a story um, that uh, breaks our heart uh, mm -hmm. as well as teaches us something um, to change our conception of the world. And, you know, while I wouldn't, when I begin writing a book, it certainly doesn't begin as grandiosely as that, but I, I do believe in the, the power of storytelling to transform um, our hearts and shape our lives because it's happened to me. Mm -hmm. And are you working on something new, Susan wanted to know? I am Susan. Yes, uh, it's uh, it's another novel, um, and I began it thinking it was going to be much simpler, and it was going to be uh, uh, not as kind of expansive as Greenwood, and it was not going to span 140 years, and it was going to knock it off in a couple of years. Uh, but that has turned out to be not the case, and it's expanding and 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 surprising me every day. But I will tell you that it's uh set on a another fictional island and it's the story of a small community um faced with a disappearance and it delves into the history of this island community as well as the mainlanders who come there 
Aha, uh -huh. that sounds that sounds great. <laughs> um, Nicola Woods, her real name, I guess. <laughs> if you were a tree, what tree would you be? She asks. Uh oh. Okay. I, I, I'm, it was said in the intro that my wife's name is Cedar mm -hmm. Bauer. Uh, she's also a writer, so I'm. I probably be a Douglas mainly because uh, they grow around my house and I love them and they're tall. <laughs> they're tall. They're so, uh, yeah, they're so beautiful out on the West Coast. The cedars, the the cedars in Ontario are a little different. Yeah. Yeah. Also beautiful though and smell wonderful. And they really um, are. So this is. I think we've kind of covered some of these questions. Let me see what else we what else we have. Um, so after reading this book, what actions are you hoping people might take toward protecting forests? Yeah. Um, Sorry. That's, yeah, I could, you know, I, I don't mind starting that one from like the canopy point of view. So, um, so, uh, the, and there's also um, information about this in the um, previous tree talk. Uh, it's, it's a little bit how we rounded that one, how we ended that one. But I think that it's really, really important to, to get into forests, to see them, to appreciate them. And then the second thing is to understand wh what they're doing and what all their amazing functions are, you know, how they're protecting biodiversity and what that does for all of us even. And then of course there is, um, you know, voting and asking uh, your governments to to protect and conserve and making that an issue and asking for it. You know, it's it's we think it's very vitally important that old growth logging ends um, right away. And then there's also sort of voting with your dollars and uh, and making sure that you're maybe not um, purchasing or investing in things that are that are helping destroy. So that's what that would be my answer for for things that that you can do and, and feel like you're actively doing. And, but getting out there and, and being in the forest makes a big difference. Um, so this is an interesting question. Um, this is from, oh, they didn't say who they're from. If we have less than eight years, according to the Stockholm Resilience Center's story summary to the Netflix film, Breaking Boundaries, The Science of Our Planet, to collectively solve our systemic problems, including deforestation, then how could you turn your novel into a film to accelerate global emotionalization? Like that's a global thing we could get behind, global emotionalization instead of deforestation. Yep. Um, how can I turn it into a film? Is that the <laughs> question? I, That's the question. I'm currently working on a TV series adaptation of Greenwood with a really great uh, producer who's worked on, uh, we used to work for HBO and has done some really, really great uh, work in the past. So it's, uh, apparently it's very expensive to produce a uh, 10 episode um, TV series that spans 140 years, but uh, we are we are very excited about um, what's been developing, and it's uh, hopefully something that that will make its way to the screen uh, at some point. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think you're right about the urgency, and you're right that this topic is critical to our survival on this planet, and. Um, anything that I can do to push that uh, uh, um, idea and emotionalize that idea further is 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 a good is a good thing and it's uh, so certainly something I'm trying to do that's excellent news I uh, I would watch the heck out of that series yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah that sounds fantastic I hope it I hope it all I hope it all happens I hope so too. I think the signs are the signs are good so far. So, um, so this is a this is a question from Lisa Shemko. I'm curious to know if the concept of the withering came to you before or after the concept of the family saga. It, so, in essence, what was the seed that began the story? Very great question. Um, I 
it began with the characters, individual characters. And so I just often, I don't know, I have a very sort of weird and intuitive way of arriving at the next thing I'm going to write. And I just sort of get a sense of a person um, who I'm interested in. And it's almost like I'm sort of passing a metal detector over a particular piece of ground and it's, you know, starts beeping. Um, and I don't know why, but I know that there's something interesting down there and the process of writing is almost the digging. Um, and so I had an idea about uh, someone finding uh, a child in the forest. Um, and, you know, this is an old, old fairy tale story uh, that goes back obviously to Moses, to um, Snow White, uh, the woodsman finding her and, and, and refusing to uh, kill her. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's all this kind of almost mythological weight to this idea. Um, and that was one of the first sort of kernel uh, ideas as well as um, uh, Jake Greenwood, uh, living in this place that is becoming more and more a place that only the wealthy can come to access this beautiful natural splendor, which is, you know, obviously very similar to Galliano Island, who, where there is a massive affordable housing crisis, where there is the real estate pressure of Vancouver. It's a, it's a, it's a sort of a similar situation. And so, I mean, it began with these people, um, who I was interested in and who I sort of couldn't stop thinking about. Um, but it wasn't until I had the structure that I knew that they were related or kind of related for the people who've read the book. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, the, it, it began with these, this sense of people, which is, is always how it starts for me. Um, and there was another question. I think this one's from Susan Gibson. Um, wondering what books are on your bedside table. Bedside table. Well, this is or, if that, or, where, or where you read. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just read Cloud Cuckoo Land by Anthony Doerr. The guy who wrote yeah. All the Light We Cannot See. Um, I'm trying to think what I've read recently. I know it's such a loaded question. You always forget. It is. Yeah. Uh, Colm Toybean's The Magician, which is about the writer Thomas Mann. Um, those are the two. They're big books, but they're they're up next. That okay. one's up next. Yep. Um, and I think that was there one other one. I think we might be we might be done. This is a um, this is another comment. I think. Um, your characters and story are so sweeping, spanning several generations in so many corners of this beloved country. Do you have the characters mapped out from the beginning of your, oh, you answered this question already, but it's, mm -hmm. but so what, what I want to share with you is all the nice things she said. This is from Elizabeth Harris. Um, she also said that uh, you're, you're writing very seamlessly to connect them by the end, which she appreciated. So thank you for that comment, Elizabeth. So if there's no more questions coming out, um, I think we're, I think we're done with the, uh, with the Q and I want to thank everyone for, for sending us questions. And I want to thank everyone for coming tonight on International Day of Forests. I especially want to thank Michael for being a, for being a part of this with us. Thank you, Laura. And it's been great fun and it's wonderful that it landed on the International Day of Forests. I'm very, uh, yeah. excited about that as well. So thanks for, thanks for having me. It's been great. We're very pleased to have you. So if you um, if you didn't come to us through our through our newsletter, we encourage you to uh, to sign up for our newsletter. It's called The Understory. Uh, you can get to it on our website, and there might have been links put into the chat for people. And um, and we'll have another tree talk probably later in the year. And thank you for being part of our community. And um, and we hope we hope you're all very very well. Bye, Michael. Thank you. Bye, Laura. Thanks. Have a nice evening. You too.